All right, so go. welcome everyone. Um, thanks for having us. I'm Eric Hofer with the Northern Illinois Fire Sprinkler Advisory Board. Um, today we're having a roundtable discussion on incentivizing fire protection systems through both federal and local offerings. Um, so today uh, we have a great group of panelists here. I'm excited to uh, have them here with me. Uh, Dan Tholotowski is currently a building inspector with the Village of Hodgkins. Uh, he is also a trustee with the Lamont Fire Protection District, and he's a retired fire marshal with the Pleasant View Fire Protection District. We also have Dave Bricker, who's the deputy chief with the Lockport Township Fire Protection District. Um, and then Mary Kay Ludeman, fire marshal for the Plainfield Fire Protection District, as well as Tom Harnsberger, who is, the, who is a trustee and a retired chief with the Carroll Fire Protection District. All right, so um, why, why financial incentives for um, fire sprinklers and fire alarms? Well, a big part of the reason for that is to make your jobs easier. Um, I, I think this would, for an AHJ, this is a huge thing to help sell these systems when you're telling someone they have to put them in. How many out there have uh, gone out to a building owner or gone out to a tenant telling them they have to install a sprinkler or a fire alarm system um, i'm sure it usually doesn't go well uh, obviously it's an added cost so what if you had the financial incentives as part of your toolbox what if you had something to offer them to say hey this is going to be a little bit easier to install now because here's some incentives for you to install that system so some of the local and federal incentives take that pressure off of you as the ahj and help you sell that system a little bit easier uh, for someone that either A, wants, has to install it, or B, maybe you're just trying to encourage them to install one. They don't necessarily have to, but it's a good idea for them to have one. Um, so with that being said, we're gonna start off with some of the local incentives, and that's why I have the other panelists here. Um, we're gonna talk about some of the local incentives that are offered uh, here in the Chicagoland area, as well as downstate in Urbana. Um, in central Illinois. Um, so starting off, we're gonna we're going to uh, talk to Mary Ludeman, and she's going to talk about the Village of Plainfield and the Plainfield Fire Protection District, the grant program that they put together. Um, before she talks about the details of the program, I'd just like to ask Mary, um, could you kind of explain how you came to uh, how you put together this grant program, how it came to be? Well, way back when we have our historic downtown in Plainfield and a lot of those buildings as they change over use, renovate, we were trying to get them to update the codes, fire sprinklers, alarms. There was a lot of pushback and resistance from the residents, the building owners. We've never had a fire here before. I'm sure everybody's heard that. These buildings are over a hundred years old. They've never burned. You know, why, why would we need this now? So, with the help of the village, we came up with this grant program that is a shared cost to incentive, give them an incentive to say, we do, you do need this. And of course, the education part comes into play that everybody's aware of. And then, but while we want you to do this, we also have these programs that could help offset the cost of you doing this to uh, make it a little less of a blow to them. Because like you said, nobody likes to hear those words. And it just makes life a little better for everyone. It gives them a feeling like we're working with them, not just trying to impose something on them that they now have to budget that maybe they didn't think they needed to budget for. And then we always, as you'll get into later in the presentation, promote as well the federal tax incentives along with our local grant. It's really been a well-received program when I'm the one bearing the news to someone that, oh, that's a great idea that you have for this building, but by the way, now you're gonna need to do this, this, and this to make it work. But we have this grant program to help you with that cost. You just, in our case, the village manages it. And then once they do their part, then it comes to us. It's been working out well. We haven't had too many cases yet because it's fairly new, but we have several that are coming down the, you know, coming down the way here soon but we did have one that was really happy with it for sure. So it's it's essentially, you're working on a lot of the historic downtown buildings. Correct. In your, in your community, um, trying to preserve the history of those buildings. As you, as you can see on the slide here, 
uh, built prior to 1968. So this includes uh, both the sprinklers, the alarms, as well as the architect costs. So it really covers um, major, you know, majority of the costs involved with installing these systems, correct? It does. And one of the things we had to do too was get buy-in from the historical preservation district. You know, they they wanted to know what this was all about because there's a lot of moving parts as as inspectors well know when you're dealing with communities you've got all these different people that have all these interests again back to these buildings never burned before we want to preserve them the way they look why do we have to do this to them that's going to ruin their historical nature so <clears throat> we made it specifically for the downtown business transition district one of the nice things we worked into that is if it's a house that can go back and forth because it's business transition. So it could be a shop one day and then back to a residential use the next day, depending on the economy and the demand for the property, we're allowing residential systems in those types of situations as well as this. I know some people wouldn't agree with that, but it's worked out well. It again takes away a lot of the cost. We're still getting somewhat what we want working with them, compromising. They don't have to put in a six inch main. They can use their domestic water in those situations only. But it, it really has helped a lot to get the buy-in that we needed for people to get on board with updating the fire codes in those historic properties. Excellent. Yeah, so as you can see there, it's a 20% total cost of the qualified improvements up to $20,000. 20, um, and, and some of the nice things that you also include are the village and the fire district to waive the permit inspection and plan review fees, as well as the village potentially waiving the water tap on fees. So um, as a whole, you know, the business owner or, you know, if it's a mixed use structure, they're really benefiting quite a bit in the end here. They are, it, it really has helped. Like you were saying, when you're trying to get them to do something they don't wanna do because of the cost, this really makes a big difference. It sure. really helps a lot. So with that being said, um, I just want to open it up. Um, does anybody have any questions uh, from our attendees? Does anybody have any questions for uh, Mary in, with regard to Plainfield's program? You can ask those in the chat section, but we've also unmuted you. So you can self unmute yourself and feel free to ask those questions. Okay, so I don't hear um, we just we just had one comment earlier on said insuring bodies also offer substantial incentives. Yes, correct, absolutely. So uh, if you have if you have questions, you know about any one of these local incentives, if you don't have a chance to ask them at the time, um, feel free to ask them at the end of the presentation. Um, but also uh, feel free to email us, and and you, we can follow up with you after the uh, uh, you know later today or or at some later date. Um, so next next up is the city of Lockport and the Lockport Township Fire Protection District. So these are actually two separate programs, but they kind of are intertwined within one, one another. So with that, I'm going to uh, hand it over to uh, Deputy Chief Dave Bricker, and he's going to explain kind of, uh, we'll, we'll start with the city of Lockport's grants. Mm -hmm. um, these are kind of unique because they were established through video gaming revenues. Correct. Uh, all right, Eric, thanks for uh, setting us up and having us here today. Uh, so uh, unlike Mary um, in Lockport in the historic downtown area, uh, we actually did have fires in the downtown area. Um, so we had a pretty significant fire in one building that uh, caused a uh, uh, one of the uh, occupants, it was a mixed use uh, motel kind of uh, bar thing. Uh, they did you know, lose a life in that fire. Um, we had a couple other buildings that were historic that uh, one actually ended a burn in the ground and you know was gone. It had the old fashioned bowling alley in the basement. And so we lost that. So we actually did end up losing some buildings in the downtown area. So uh, as you know, as people came in to start, uh, you know, renovating, same, same story. Nobody wants to put sprinklers and fire alarms in. Uh, the city did have a, an issue on their end with the water supply. Uh, the old downtown area had a terrible water supply. So the city did their part. Uh, by putting in all new water mains. Um, so they were able to supply sprinkler systems. So that worked out good. They've done a ton of work on the water system. So uh, they can you know, actually bring these pipes into the buildings. The city's taking care of along the main street, uh, trying to get the water mains into the buildings and, and taking care of that for the, the buildings. 
uh, that hotel that had that was mixed use hotel uh, that was one of our first ones to take advantage of the program uh, they were the city bought the building for next to nothing uh, and then they sold it for pretty much nothing to a developer um, who took advantage of it and, and turned it into a very nice uh, restaurant bar combination uh, building so that was kind of nice uh, the other buildings we had a couple other buildings in town that decided to take advantage of the program uh, that uh, didn't really apply the initial part of the program there was a little bit more you know hoops to jump through as far as how to apply stuff like that so the city kind of saw that was kind of a hindrance so they kind of restructured the the application process that helped tremendously so basically um, you know we've had a, a pretty much anybody that's going to do work downtown they are going to do if they have to sprinkle it they're applying for the grant if they have to do a fire alarm they're applying for the grant so um, it has worked out uh, the initial uh, thing when they said that they would cover 50 percent of the the cost of a fire alarm up to 5,000 or a sprinkler up to 15,000 um, or both they would give 20,000 um, you know they, they it was kind of based on availability but right now there hasn't been an issue with availability that anybody that's applied pretty much has gotten it so that's been good uh, we have one gentleman that's really kind of taken over the renovation of Lockport and he's really taking advantage because he's kind of the only one doing most of the work down there um, and as far as the you know the the initial the waiving the fees that was always something right from the start that it was very easy to do uh, on the city's part and the fire district's part was just to say you know what you know we're not going to charge them for plan review fees and stuff like that so that was that was pretty easy um, the one thing that they did do the the city took it away from not just the downtown area they said okay the downtown area definitely needs it so they're using it there so they went down uh, north uh, I don't know if anybody's familiar with you know the general area but north on uh, State Street turns into kind of Archer Avenue, uh, then East on 9th Street. Uh, there's some buildings there, they may not be considered historic. Uh, they were just built prior to 2003. So it's not that they were, you know, 100 years old, like some of the original buildings that were included in this were, you know, well over 100 years old and stuff like that. But uh, they even took some of just the older buildings, but not historic buildings and applied it to those properties also. Because again, you know, because they're kind of tied to the whole downtown Lockport area, they just felt that let's just try to you know get everybody to use this so uh so the gentleman that's kind of doing the downtown area took over a building a little bit north on state street uh that was a two-story mainly business type building and redid the first floor just to businesses took the entire second floor made it multi-family and sprinkled that whole building so it's really been a very beneficial program in that respect so the way that the fire district tapped into it uh, so after talking about, you know, with the city and stuff and working very closely with the city, you know, the fire district, like I said, initially it was like a very easy just to do review fees. I mean, that's that's really nothing. So so the fire district kind of went the next step further and, you know, established a program where, OK, they're going to do the fire alarm and the sprinkler system. You know, the way that the fire district was going to also incentivize this was to so rebate their portion of the taxes from their uh, tax bill that the fire district charges. Uh, so if they did a fire alarm, it was going to be a two-year rebate. If it was a sprinkler system, they were going to get a five-year rebate on their portion of the taxes. Um, so that is, you know, again, it's just, it's obviously another way. I mean, so, you know, if their portion of the tax bill, you know, if they're paying the fire district $1,000, you know, over five years, that's, you know, another $5,000 savings for them. So that's, you know, really kind of uh, a huge thing. So, um, you know, just by working together and having that close relationship between the city and the fire district is, has been good. I, you know, obviously there's, you know, unfortunately there's some fire districts that don't have, you know, that, that same, you know, rapport that we do with the city. So we're very, very fortunate that the city of Lockport really wanted to, to work with us on this, you know, and, and because of the influx of gaming money, uh, that's, that's how they were able to start it. Um, you know, we, we, we're doing something in a, in a different town that's been using their gaming money for something else but it's safety related so so this gaming money is, is really kind of helped out you know us on a couple of different fronts so so that's been been very well for us so. yes uh, and you know as you said you know it's not just um you know the city's offering money but then you're also the the fire district is also doing the tax rebate so it's it's a hybrid program between the two and again a, a joint uh, partnership and making sure that these buildings, um, historic and, and non-historic, are um, being maintained mm -hmm. and being preserved for the future. So exactly, yeah. The city's been very good about uh, in, in their last, you know, code upgrades. Uh, 
you know, they, they went with a 5,000 square foot, um, you know, they didn't, we, we couldn't get them to zero. We had them at zero, um, you know, but they, they decided on 5,000, but, um, but yeah, they've, they've always been in the, you know, with the downtown area. Yeah. Like you said, it's nobody wants to do it. Um, but by doing this program, I really don't hear any complaints anymore about people having to do it. So that's kind of taking that part out of it. So it's kind of nice. Excellent. Does anybody have any questions for Dave? Unmute yourself and feel free to ask. And again, we can ask, uh, you know, if, if you don't feel comfortable now, we can follow up later. All right, so we'll move on then. Um, the next one is actually similar to the past two. Um, this is the village of Glen Ellen. We don't have anybody with the village um, to talk about it, but um, basically the village of Glen Ellen has these fire prevention awards and it's very similar to Lockport as well as Plainfield in the fact that, you know, those of you that know Glen Ellen, there's a lot of historic buildings in the downtown area and it's trying to preserve those buildings. So they established the program back in 2018 um, and it's it's really designated for um, their central business districts, which is that historic downtown area, but as well as um, the Roosevelt Road TIF district. And so with this program, um, they can install or upgrade fire sprinklers, they can install fire alarms, and um, any associated electrical water or water or electrical or water service improvements. So um, with this program, they're they're a little bit different as well in the way that they award it. Um, it's 50% of the costs are awarded on a sliding scale up to $15,000. So projects have to have a minimum budget of $2,000. So if you have a $2,000 budget, um, you're going to get an incentive of $1,000 uh, back. Um, and I believe it goes up to $3,999. $3, you'll get that $1,000. Once you get up to $4,000 and then that next level, um, it, it'll actually go up to the $2,000 uh, mark. So uh, they've actually had a lot of success with this program. We didn't actually find out about it until about late 2019, early 2020. And But in that short amount of time since they uh, started this program in 2018, uh, in May of 2018, they've already awarded $124,500. So it's another example of, a, of success, um, just establishing an incentive program. And for them, this was you know, just part of the incentives that they offered. They also had some um, exterior facade improvements um, that they, you know, that they helped fund. Um, so not only, you know, making sure that these buildings are safe and preserved on the inside, but also making them look nice on the outside. Now that's a separate program, but again, they're, they're committed to making sure that those buildings exist for future generations. So that's the, the village of Glen Ellen. Um, from there, we're actually going to move on to, um, so those are some commercial and business oriented incentives. We're going to uh, talk about residential now. And the first residential of the two that we have um, is the Carroll Fire Protection District. And as I said, we have Tom Harnsberger, who's a current trustee with the fire district in Urbana. And he's also a former chief there. And he can talk about the grant program that they have set up for residential homes. Uh, we set up our grant program several years ago and uh, what we wanted to do was as a fire board we wanted to provide the best fire protection that we could for our residents uh, now our fire district is not the city of urbana it's an area outside the city and we have no commercial strip we have no schools we have a lot of trailer parks um, and two or three subdivisions and we wanted to encourage uh, fire sprinklers for various reasons that uh, we don't have to worry about carrying people out of the, their homes in body bags we don't have to worry about our firefighters going into compromised structures and so on down the list. Um, we, the Illinois Association of Fire Protection Districts lobbied um, 
and got a bill, a public act that permitted fire protection districts to establish a grant program for 13D systems. And it allows a lot of leeway on how you set that up. And what we did was we set aside $2,000 in aggregate per year. And then the property owner that has installed a 13D system would come to the board and say, I have a system that's working. And if you'd like to come look at it, you're more than welcome to. And for that, we give them a 25% rebate back from their annual real estate taxes that come to support the fire district. And it's an ongoing thing so that if the board funds this line item every year, a homeowner can get the rebate back for 20 years, 50 years, however long the fire district is in existence. Yeah, so this is, as you said, it's an ongoing program. So what the great thing about this is, just like if you have an insurance break because you have fire sprinklers in your home, you take advantage of that annually, and then you take this tax rebate as well, you're actually getting money back every single year that system is in place. So long as, as you said, so long as the district is still there, this incentive is still there along with their insurance savings. Right. And typically on my home, I get 25% break on my homeowner's insurance because I have smoke detectors, I have a central station monitoring my alarm, and I have fire sprinklers. Yes, so between the insurance savings and this rebate, it's, again, you know, these homeowners can benefit annually. So anything else to add on that, Tom? No, that's pretty much it. Excellent, thank you for that. So that's our first residential program. Our second one is the Village of Hodgkins. And with the Village of Hodgkins is Dan Tholotowski. So I'll hand it over to him and he can talk about their unique program for one and two family homes as well as mobile homes. Dan, you're muted. There you go. Okay, sorry about that, folks. Uh, good afternoon. Thank you very much, Eric, for hosting this and also for the Illinois Fire Inspectors and for my co uh, representatives here today. Very interesting and unique programs that they have. Um, the village of Hodgkins is a unique village. It's uh, very small as far as residents go in town. It's uh, probably about uh, ooh, eight blocks uh, in nature, eight square blocks or so in the residential area three mobile home parks, and the village itself has always been very proactive with respect to fire sprinkler installation. I can count on probably one hand here that uh, of the structures in town that are not sprinkled, the non-residential commercial properties. Um, with respect to this uh, residential aspect though, that's never really been addressed until 2015. We started to update our building codes here, and of course, when we adopted the International Fire Code, guess what? Uh, residential sprinklers were, were there, and a lot of people have done a lot of different things with those to try and amend those out or, or modify them or such. And uh, when we approached our mayor and our council with respect to that, uh, our mayor and, and the council, again, are very tight-knit. It's a very old school, um, but big-hearted community. And they didn't want to ruffle any feathers as far as, you know, forcing anything down anybody's uh, throat, if you will, with regards to fire sprinklers. 
They understand the importance of it. They saw the uh, saves on our Pleasant View fire protection uh, save tree on the commercial properties, and they understand the importance of life safety. Um, with that being said, they said, well, why don't we make it then instead of a, a hard and fast requirement to make it a, a, a more or less a voluntary program, but we can help them out with respect to that. And with that, when they established uh, the modification on the 2015 International Code in 2019, they adopted a ordinance with regards to 13D systems where uh, if you were to put a fire sprinkler in your home, whether it new or existing or mobile home, that the village would cover one half the cost of the installation of the fire sprinkler system. Uh, besides that, they would upgrade 100% the water service to that structure if need be. And if you choose not to put the sprinkler system in, at this point in time, they would still upgrade that water service for future dates. And since that's occurred, they went a step further because they've been involved in a beautification program within the uh, older part of the community. And those properties that are more or less blighted or fell in disrepair, the village had purchased several properties over time and had those properties demolished. And with those, that being said, the empty lots now are up for resale. With respect to that, the village is done one step further again not requiring uh at that point in time years ago to put in these sprinkler systems but now uh since that has occurred in 2020 august of last year they've passed an ordinance that said if we sell the property to a developer or to a uh, a homeowner contractor you will be required to put in the automatic fire sprinkler system in the residence a 13d system However, the incentives still apply for the upgraded water system at 100% and the total installation at 100 or 50% for the sprinkler. But you will be required at that point in time, if you purchase village uh, property, you will be required to install it, uh, the system, and it, we will pick up half the cost on that. Yeah, so it's, it's, a, it's a way of getting some of the older stock um, little by little, potentially getting that older stock of homes updated, um, but as well as if anything new goes in, um, it can it can have the advantage of having sprinklers in it. Right now, currently, we've had one home that uh, that fell into the program and took advantage of the uh, of the grant assistance program, and we've got several properties now that are for sale for the village, and we hope that. Uh, Again, those will be depending on the housing market that they, they build on them and then they will be required to put those in. But again, taking advantage of the uh, installation. So it's a win-win for everybody, it really is. Yes. And I was just curious with regards to uh, some of our other uh, co-panelists there, how successful they've been. For example, with Dave, a question I had for him was how successful uh, the fire district's been and people taking advantage of the tax break incentives. Uh, that's the one thing that uh, not a lot of people have gone that route. They, as long as they get the, the money to save on the installation, no, not as many of them have actually applied for the fire district part of it. You know, they're happy that we did the reviews uh, for free and, but uh, you know, very few of them have actually gone to the fire district and asked for that part of it. So, um, you know, they're advised about it, but you know, there's really no, process for that it's just basically let us know and you know we'll take care of it but yeah so it's not been very um you know for some reason they just don't follow up on that part of it yeah, one thing i've got to add as well too is that uh, review fees and such have been waived by the fire district pleasant view has been real good and will continue to work uh that respect for the residents here in town so again mm -hmm. We're trying, and, and again, we have all these great incentive programs. And Dave, you probably touched upon it. You can lead a horse. You can lead a horse to water, you know. But sometimes, you know, mm -hmm. trying to get them to take advantage and take a drink. But we're doing what we can. Yep. So thank you, Dan. I think you know. I think you bring up a good point. You know, obviously, um, you can't get anybody that you know. Some some people are just not going to take care take part in these programs, no matter what. But um, if we can encourage them with these types of incentives, it definitely gets them a little bit closer to um, considering it 
um, and and it gets those those communities safer little by little. So. And we're trying to do our part and with respect to that we need to get the word out locally in our community here we have uh, newsletters that come out quarterly so one of the, the features we want to do is the 13d uh, incentive program so people are aware of it and, and, and again educating them yes yeah all about education when it comes to these programs if they're not aware of it they don't know they can they can take advantage of it so um with that that's that's the local incentives so I just want to open it up uh, first, uh, see if there's any questions before we head into the federal tax incentives. Um, so if anybody has any questions, now's a good time in regard to the local programs. None have come in through the chat feature and I don't see people unmuting themselves. Okay, well then we'll move on then. The, uh, the federal tax incentives, it's a little bit more uh in depth here so i um i apologize but some of it is a little bit necessary to help you understand you may have heard about these programs over the last few years um but the issue is you know there's a lot of misunderstanding and quite honestly even after hearing it here um there might still be some uh questions that need to be asked and what it comes down to is um these business owners that can benefit from these federal incentives really need to talk with their tax advisors. And that's the best thing that they can do to make sure, um, you know, the tax code is very complicated and um, that's how they can make sure that they really truly can benefit from installing a fire sprinkler or a fire alarm system. So with that being said, the first of that federal legislation was in 2017, it was part of the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act, and it added fire sprinklers and alarms as qualified real property in section 179. Um, you'll see there, uh, in the second to last line for C, it says that fire protection and alarm systems are now um, an improvement to re non-residential real property um, that can take advantage of uh, these tax breaks. So one of the other benefits of that Tax Cuts and Jobs Act is the deduction that they can take advantage of went from 500 to a million. And since then it goes up it's gone up every single year. So now that that deduction can be up to 1.05 million for if you're filing taxes in 2022 for 2021. Um, so they can they can deduct that full cost of equipment up to 1.05 million. That's an important number to, to remember um, as we go along here. Um, but this is section 179 is really aimed at small to medium sized businesses. So they're purchasing anywhere from 5,000 to $2.62 million. Uh, you, you might say, you know, 2.62 million seems like a lot for a small to medium size, but, you know, consider the Amazon types and what they're spending in equipment in a single year. So um, you can claim that full deduction of 1.05 million as a business owner up, up to, if you spend up to 2.62 million in uh, spending cap on those qualified equipment purchases so if you go over that 2.62 million now you don't get that full 1.05 million deductible um it starts phasing out so if you could take that 2.62 million and dollar for dollar as you go up a dollar it takes away a dollar of that deduction um it actually phases out completely at 3.67 million so um it's it's important to keep in mind again this is for small to medium-sized businesses the corporations, the larger larger companies, that's something that we will talk about in the section 160 well, section section 168 changes that happened in 2020. But even if that phases out completely, as I said, they can take advantage of section 168 possibly, or just do simple tax deductions. So a good example of this is if you have a business that spends a million dollars on equipment which could be sprinklers and alarms. And keep in mind, this also includes their other purchases and qualifying equipment. So it's not just the fire sprinklers, it's not just the fire alarms, it's anything else that they can write off as well. Um, if it adds up to only a million, um, that's one option. Second option is they spend up to 2.62. Third is 3.65 and business D uh, spends over 3.67 million. So what would the deduction amount be for each business? And here's some here's the answers for those. Business A, they get the full deduction. 
they didn't meet that 1.05. They didn't go as, or, you know, they didn't go beyond that, but so they can only take advantage of what they spent. For business B, they can take, they're under that threshold, um, that threshold of 2.62 million, or they re, they're right at it. So they can take that 1.05 million deduction still. Business C, um, they actually fall just underneath that that uh, threshold that where it phases out completely. So they only can actually take advantage up to twenty thousand um, dollars because they fell on twenty thousand under the purchase limit. And then business D, they went over. They're no longer considered a small to medium sized business. Um, they they have reached their phase out purchase limit, so they might have to take uh, advantage instead of section 168, uh, uh, the bonus depreciation. Let me interject with the question. When you talked about a single year, I assume you're talking a calendar year. Therefore, if a business were to carry this from the end of one year to the beginning of the next, they might be able to qualify 100% times two years. Uh, you, it depends on how they split up those costs in one year. Um, if I'm, they would have some costs in that first tax year, and then that second tax year, you might have some additional costs. So they're, they're not going to be able to carry over the full cost from one year and, and then the next, but they would split those costs out if it's an ongoing project. I assume that's what you're asking? Right. If they could phase the project in over the course of two calendar years, they might be able to incentivize more deductions. Yes, I, I believe that is, the, that's again, one of those things that they really have to ask their tax advisor. And I think it depends on how the costs are incurred. If they're an ongoing incurred costs, I don't see why they can't spread those out over two years. I, absolutely. Um, so we'll use business A as an example. They spent that $1 million on the qualifying equipment, which again, could be fire sprinklers, it could be alarms, or it could be both, as well as other things that qualify. Um, if they were using the old tax code, there's no accelerated first year deduction, and they would have to spread that out evenly over 39 years. So again, uh, you know, if we go back to the way things were, what's the incentive to get a business owner to retrofit their building with a fire alarm or fire sprinkler system if they're taking it and spreading it out over 39 years of depreciation? There's not a whole lot of incentive. So with this new tax code that passed in 2017, now they can now they can uh, have that first year tax deduction and then still spread out over those remaining 38 years. So as a little uh, calculation here, they got that $1 million, they don't get to take advantage of the section 168 bonus depreciation because they're doing this. Um, normally they wouldn't get a deduction anyway in that first year if we're in the old tax code. So for their total first year tax tax deduction, they get that 100% um, amount, you know, $1 million. So if you put them, let's say they're in the 35% tax bracket, they've just saved $350,000 on purchases um, for that first year. So instead of paying a million, you know, they may pay a million dollars for that system, they're getting $350,000 back, lowering that cost in that first year to 650,000, so that's a significant savings. But again, it's based on your tax bracket. So in this case, this business we would say is a 35% tax bracket. So again, it's it's now linked to the tax bracket, but even though it's, it's, it's a little bit different than it was set up in the past, by linking it to the tax bra bracket, it is still beneficial. So, um, you know, that there is, that's a, that's a huge savings for them. So the remaining uh, 650,000, out of that $650,000, they would then depreciate those next, uh, you know, 38 years, it says 39, but it's actually 38 years, um, would be about 23,000 a year. So they get that initial first year benefit and then they would just depreciate it like they normally would. So then for um, in 2020, as part of the coronavirus legislation, um, they actually had all along meant to have this one piece of section 168 in that 2017 legislation. My understanding is it was in there, 
It was kind of off in the margins. There was handwritten notes all over thousands of pages of, of legislation and somehow it kind of got left out. So the 2020 CARES Act, they were able to include this, this correction, this technical correction to the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act. And this incentive is for businesses of any size to ins install fire sprinklers and fire alarms. Um, so it actually is retro, and, and the way that you know it's a technical correction, it's re retroactive to September 17, 2017. Um, so going back to when the tax code was passed in 2017, they're letting it be retroactive. So if you have a building that has installed sprinklers or it has installed fire alarms between then and now, um, they can retroactively go back and uh, appeal their taxes and they can take advantage of this section 168. So in the 1986 edition of section 168 says it's 39 year depreciation window. But now they're saying, yeah, that's still there, but fire sprinklers and alarms, the retrofits, they're included under bonus depreciation. So they have to be uh, under this umbrella of qualified improvement properties. Um, so it's, it has to be an interior existing commercial property um, improvement. So again, they have three options for expensing these qualified improvement properties. They could do the simple or normal depreciation. They can do a tax deduction from section 179 like we just went through with that um, million dollar business A, million dollar spending business A. And then uh, they could do this bonus depreciation from section 168. So it's important to say, you know, to note this, with this section 168, if they're one of those no longer small to medium-sized businesses, they can't benefit from the section 179, or maybe they, um, you know, they're just looking to go this route as a small to medium-sized business because they can get a better benefit. Um, it does have a phase-out timeline. So that first year bonus depreciation expires completely in 2027. You'll see here this chart, it shows you the old tax code uh, versus the new tax code. So the old tax code did have some uh, phase out, but it was uh, phasing out in 2020. So it'd already be gone as of this year. Um, this new tax code extends it from the time in 2017 all the way into 2022, you get a hundred percent benefit. Um, then it phases out 20% at a time down, down to zero in 2027. At that time, the one thing it changed, it's, it, it changed the uh, the depreciation schedule to 15 years. So now we're not looking at 39 years, it's, it's gonna be 15 years after that. So uh, using both sections 168, 179 to do the calculations of how you can take advantage of this. Um, let's say you have a project, um, sprinklers, alarms, both, um, and other qualifying equipment, let's say it's $2.82 million. Well, that puts them over that 2.62 million spending cap from section 179. So if you take that 1.05 million deduction that they could have had, but they, since they went over that spending cap, you take away 200,000. That's why you see that 850,000 there. They went over that spending cap by 200,000. Um, so, the section 168 bonus depreciation in 2021, the current year, it's 100%. So you get the 1.97 million. If this were 2024, 25, you're gonna get lower percentages. So that number is gonna come down off that 2.82 million. You're not gonna get as much of a benefit. So we, we worked that against this the tax bracket for this particular business. We're just gonna say it's a 35% uh, tax bracket again. They're going to get cash savings of 987,000 out uh, off of the purchase, uh, cash savings on the purchase. So $987,000 on a uh, $2.82 million project, they're walking away with a much lower cost on that, on those purchases of 1.833 million. So again, I know this is lots of math, um, but you know, what it basically comes down to is, um, this is this is a huge savings that they can take advantage of in the first year. No longer spreading it out, no longer saying, hey, you know, you install this now, but you're not going to benefit for quite some time as far as financially. Obviously, you're going to have that uh, life and property savings.
But now with these incentives, they get a really good benefit financially in that first year. And so, but, uh, the, but the point of it is, you know, we're not tax professionals here. Um, if we were, we wouldn't need them. So if you have a question in your community, you know, if, you, if you're promoting this out there and you have somebody, a business owner questioning something, the best thing for them to do is consult with their tax advisor. You and I are not tax experts, um, but we can provide the basic information to get them and encourage them and advocate for them to install sprinklers. Um, but ultimately they've got to find out if they qualify. We don't know their businesses. We don't know how much they're spending, um, what, other, what other types of equipment they're spending on. Only they, they and their uh, tax advisor could know that. So it's really important to promote it, but also explain that you know, they, each, each business can be a little bit different in how they qualify. Um, so with that, you know, just some other federal incentives that are in the works, just so you have an idea. And you know, these are at various stages, but one of the things is a Public Housing Fire Safety Act. Um, that would create a competitive grant program of $25 million a year for 10 years through HUD, uh, Housing and Urban Development. And that would be designed for local and state housing authorities to retrofit sprinklers in their high rises, residential high rises. So that was in response to the Minneapolis fire, uh, Cedar High Apartments that killed five. Um, in fact, they just passed some, they just went through the house up in Minneapolis and uh, passed some legislation to retrofit buildings there locally but this would be an incentive that they could take advantage of on a national level. Also the High Rise Fire Sprinkler Incentive Act would include uh, residential now, residential high rises uh, to retrofit fire sprinklers. And it accelerates the depreciation schedule to 15 years from the current 27 and a half years for residential or 39 for commercial. So those are some other things that are in the works. Um, you know, that's not to say that they will or will not pass, um, but they are being worked on at a national level right now. So with all these with all these different incentives, both the local that we talked about earlier, as well as these federal incentives, what's the outcome of it? Well, you have the economic savings that leads to market growth in your area. Um, and you also have um, preservation of, of buildings within the community. But most importantly, you're protecting the lives and property. So. These incentives really, they're an encouragement for build, building owners, business owners that might not otherwise install uh, sprinklers or, or, or fire alarms, um, but it is a huge, tremendous benefit, especially when you can go, combine the local with the federal incentives. So um, we'll open it up to questions. Here's my contact information, but I, I um, that's it for our presentation today. I'd like to thank our our presenters, our panelists, um, for coming on and helping me with this this uh, discussion and talking about their local communities.